philosophy is dead and the Germans kill it. How? By becoming extremely good at it, so they were able to implode it from the inside. Guten Tag. Hey everyone. In 1869, the Russian giant Leo Tolstoy wrote the following passage in War and Peace about the differences between European peoples. Quote, Germans are self-confident on the basis of an abstract notion, science. That is the supposed knowledge of absolute truth. A Frenchman is self-assured because he regards himself personally, both in mind and body, as irresistibly attractive to men and women. An Englishman is self-assured as being the citizen of the best organized state in the world and therefore as an Englishman always knows what he should do and knows that all he does as an Englishman is undoubtedly correct. An Italian is self-assured because he is excitable and easily forgets himself and other people. A Russian is self-assured because he knows nothing and does not want to know anything since he does not believe that anything can be known. The German self-assurance is worse to fall stronger and more repulsive than any other because he imagines that he knows the truth, science, which he himself has invented, but which is for him the absolute truth. While Leo Tolstoy is a little bit funny in this observation of Europeans, there is no doubt that German-speaking world produced some of the greatest philosophers of all time. Gottfried Leibniz, Immanuel Kant, George Haeckel, Arthur Schopenhauer, Karl Marx, Friedrich Nietzsche, Martin Heidegger, and Johann Habermas, to name just a few. Add to that, two of the most famous psychoanalysts, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, also came from the German-speaking world. It's no exaggeration to say that modern philosophy comes from Kant. He's like a funnel that brought two schools of philosophy, rationalism and empiricism, together. And ever since, all philosophers have tried to respond or build on Kant's idea. A note of clarification, by Germans I don't mean the citizens of Germany today, but speakers of the German language in the past few centuries, so these include Austrians and Swiss. So what led the Germans to dominate philosophy, and how that resulted in the death of philosophy? To answer this question, we ask what philosophy is. Simply put, philosophy is a rational approach to understand three basic topics – life, physical reality, and the human mind. Prior to rational philosophy, people accepted a religious view of the world, and some still do. What is rationality? Sometimes referred to as reason, it's a learned tool. Rationality is simply past mistakes. Since the invention of writing, we can read as far back as 4,000 years ago, so we can rationally analyze our past. Also, science are nothing but the past trials and errors of human species collected over centuries and written down. So philosophers wanted to explain things using reason. For example, Socrates is famous for his method of asking questions. So throughout history, philosophers ask the why questions. Why are we alive? Why is the world the way it is? And finally, why do we have consciousness? But the German philosopher shifted slightly more to the how question. This looks very simple, but it was revolutionary. Kant's greatest contribution was epistemology, how we know what we know. So what is the difference between why and how? It is enormous. To answer the why question, you don't have to leave your desk. You can just theorize in your head. But to answer the how question, you might need to get your hands dirty. Why question is theoretical and how question is more analytical. A theory mainly looks at a bigger picture, so you go atop of a mountain to observe things from a distance, while analysis breaks it down to look at the smaller parts, which means you have to be closer, not far. A theoretician looks at a structure or a machine and asks why it's there, and makes educated guesses or builds theories, while an analyst asks how it is made by breaking it down into smaller parts and then building them again. To understand a machine, you have to break it down. To understand life, you have to dissect frog, fortunately. But why were Germans more analytical? But what made the German speakers more analytical? Perhaps the obvious place to look at is the cold climate of Northern Europe. 
When half of the year you face harsh, biting, cold winters, you come to your senses. Not only your rationality kicks in, but also the cold climate trains your analytical mind to solve the practical problems of how to survive. You have less time to theorize because you have woods to chop, leaky roofs to mend, food to gather, and be ready to solve any problems you may face. People living in the tropics can afford to stay in the hammock a bit longer because the party never starts on time. In Germany, however, you better come on time, otherwise the beer and sausage might be gone. Necessity is the mother of invention. In a cold Darwinian world where the fastest, the fittest and the fattest survive a winter hibernation. Okay, but many people live in cold climates and you haven't really answered why Germans make good philosophers. One of the most common German stereotypes is timekeeping. In fact, you can see that the watchmaking industry has been the monopoly of the German-speaking world, especially in the south, on either side of the Swiss border, for centuries. Japan is another punctual nation, so they're also known for their watches. Punctuality and productivity often go hand in hand. Diligence helps precision and quality. In the tropics, you are less likely to make precision watches to tell you time in minute details because time moves slowly. Punctual nations tend to be prosperous nations, except if you're oil rich. Germany, Switzerland, Scandinavia, Japan and Singapore to name a few countries where punctuality is important. This country's economic success is no accident. It was achieved through rigorous education, disciplined work, but above all, punctuality. Immanuel Kant personifies German seriousness. He lived such a regimented life that he would get up at exactly 5 a.m., have breakfast, give lecture from 7 to 11, have lunch, meet friends, and repeat the same routine for his entire career. Never married, nor had kids, probably never laughed. Why? Because philosophy is no laughing matter. Kant was a machine, a rational machine, who lived for 79 years. Time is so important to the Germans that Martin Heidegger's masterpiece, Being in Time's main premise is time. I recently talked about the Russian classic novel Oblomov by Ivan Goncharov, written in 1859, 10 years before War and Peace. It's about a Russian man who is so lazy that he refuses to get out of bed, so he spends his entire life glued to the bed. But his friend is extremely disciplined and hard worker. Why? Because he has a German father. Even centuries ago, this stereotype of Germans being disciplined and hard workers existed in Russia. Add into great philosophers some of the greatest composers like Mozart, Beethoven, Bach, Wagner, etc. came from the German-speaking world. 3,000 years ago in ancient Greece, Pythagoras noticed the connection between music and mathematics. To succeed in today's world, a good knowledge of mathematics is crucial. Do you know the easiest way to learn mathematics as well as computer science that is right at your fingertips? Brilliant makes it so easy for anyone to learn mathematics and computer science from the very basics to the very high levels. It's all interactive. You are not sitting in the classroom board, but you are an active participant. Brilliant has thousands of lessons from foundational to advanced maths to AI, data science, neural networks and more, with new lessons added monthly. Not sure where to start with programming? The new Thinking in Code course gets you designing simple programs to solve real-world problems right away, from Maps app navigation to writing a program that automatically responds to work messages. To help you get started, try Brilliant for free for a full 30 days, so click on the links in the description or go to brilliant.org slash fictionbeast. Also, the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Another common stereotype about Germans is that they don't have sense of humor. Generally, stereotypes exist for a reason. Germans do tend to be more matter-of-fact. Let's look at the biggest German car company's slogan. Volkswagen's slogan is Das Auto, which literally means their car. This is my theory. I think in the early days, Volkswagen Beetle was a bit confusing to the Germans. Was it a car or was it an insect? So the company made sure people understood that it was a car. Das Auto. Okay, let's stop making stupid jokes. People with a sense of humor aren't as productive as someone who is serious. If you don't believe me, watch the British office David Brand. Serious people have no time to laugh or make sarcastic jokes. It is time to work. It's time to chop wood. 
Now let's get serious. Why did philosophy explode in the German-speaking world in the first place? Let's talk about religion. The world's largest religions have their origin in warm places. Christianity, Islam, Judaism came from the Middle East, while Hinduism and Buddhism came from India. If you combine these five religions, it covers about 70% of the world population today. So what is the connection between religion and Germans being good philosophers? Christianity is a 2,000-year-old religion. With its center in Rome, Italy, it has remained pretty much unchanged for centuries. If left to their own devices, they want to keep their tradition for another 2,000 years. But in Northern Europe, faced with cold, Christianity went through a hibernation and then transformation. Starting in 1517 with the publication of Martin Luther's 95 Theses or 95 Mistakes he found in the Catholic Church, a series of reforms shifted religious views in the German-speaking world. It was handy because a century before Luther wrote his theses, another German, Mr. Gutenberg, invented the printing press in 1440 in the city of Mainz. 30 minutes from Mainz, in the city of Worms, Luther stood in front of a committee and affirmed his anti-Roman Catholic stance and the rest is history. Christianity had its origin in warm climate in the Middle East, and by the time it traveled to Northern Europe, it did feel out of place because of one thing. In warm places, people gravitate towards each other, so people are much friendlier. Hence, they congregate in warm place, while in cold climate, people keep their distances. This is perhaps why people who move in harsher climates want to have space to get away from others. So the Lutheran reformers hated one thing about the Catholic Church, centralized power. Rome had the monopoly. The Catholic Church was telling everyone, my way or the highway. The Germans took the highway, the Autobahn to be precise. The German-speaking merchants wanted a little change, a little autonomy. So the Northern Reformation movement wanted more power given to the merchants, nation states and local cities. In other words, they wanted freedom from Rome to do their own church, marry and divorce the way they wanted. There's a clear link between Christian Reformation in the 16th century and the rapid rise in German philosophy. It was a burst of energy, like when particles hit the Hadron Collider. The religious spell was broken. Now the Germans were free to play their own Metallica songs, not just some Catholic hymns. If you don't believe me, the first German philosopher, Jakob Bohme, who lived between 1575 and 1624, was in fact a Lutheran. Consider the father of German philosophy influencing the likes of George Hegel, Friedrich Schilling. Bohme was the first to propose dialectical philosophy of thesis, antithesis and synthesis, which Hegel took up to explain history and later Marx turned it into a bulldozer of revolution and social change. So Christian Reformation had a big influence on the rapid rise of German philosophy as well as science. It opened the Pandora's box or a can of beer. Now the German mind was liberated from the grip of the Catholic Church in Rome. Soon after, with the likes of Gottfried Leibniz, philosophers moved from religion altogether to rational science to explain the world. Leibniz was a great scientist with many scientific accomplishments, on par with the likes of Isaac Newton. You can see how a simple church reform can transform the German world into becoming the pinnacle of science, philosophy and music. But hold on your horse, the Catholic Church had no control in most part of the world, so why the Germans exploded in philosophy and science, not others? There's this thing called German philosophical idealism, which is similar to Plato's philosophy, but it's not the same. Plato argued that forms or the idea of something is primary in us, while its material version is kind of secondary. For example, we have an idea of a chair, but chairs come in many different shapes, sizes and styles. But in our mind, we are never confused by those variations. Why? Because the idea of chairs inside our mind. In short, its mental form comes before the material object. German idealism basically explains reality in a similar fashion. Whatever reality you experience is a representation of that reality. Philosophers like Kant divided reality into two realms, phenomena and noumena. 
phenomena or our experience of things while noumena is the things in themselves. Schopenhauer also argues the world is made of will and representation. The will is the real thing, but we only see the glimpse of the actual will because it's called representation. Perhaps a crude way of explaining this is reality versus appearance. We cannot fully grasp reality because we only understand how it appears to us. In other words, we only have an idea of reality, but we can never grasp it. The German philosophers continued the philosophy of idealism until Marx, who put materialism above all else. Now, why is idealism important here? It's counterintuitive because we associate the Germans with analytical pragmatism, not idealism. But in German philosophy, the separation of matter and idea gives human a superpower because we are the deciding force. Immanuel Kant says that we humans impose our mental structure onto the world. It makes sense because we see everything through a human lens. Even our tools are the product of the human mind. Since we impose our mental structure onto the world, we are the ones who categorize reality the way we see it. This Kantian idea coincided with European Enlightenment humanism in which smart humans replaced the Christian God as the true master of Earth. So Kantian philosophy was revolutionary in how humans can dictate reality to some extent, albeit philosophically. Just as Lutheran reform liberated the Germans to be free from Rome, Kantian philosophy liberated philosophy from the realm of God and put humans on the ascendancy. Philosophy is human. Knowledge is human. It is no surprise that Kant inspired Hegel, Schopenhauer, Marx, Nietzsche, and many more. Okay, apart from the cold climate, church reform, German punctuality, and philosophical idealism, the German language is also very unique. What is unique about German? Compound words. In German, you can add words together or add prefixes and suffixes to words to make them longer and longer to a ridiculous extent. Some of them are so long that they become paragraphs by themselves. Look at this one. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it. Schadenfreude is a very well-known German word in English, which means pleasure in the misfortunes of others. This word combines two German words. Schaden means damage and Freud means joy. But why is compoundability connected to German philosophy and makes Germans to be great philosophers? This flexibility allows you to express abstract ideas, therefore giving them precise expression. When you analyze things, break things down into tiny bits, you need the ability to compound words to describe those precise, subtle ideas. Quote, the limits of my language means the limits of my world, said Ludwig Wittgenstein, another German philosopher. German compoundability allows precision in philosophical expression, like a German watch tells the time, or a German knife gets through. This is why reading Kant, Heidegger, Wittgenstein is very tedious for philosophy students. Why? When translated into English, it's very hard to convey those abstract notions, given the ability of the English language. Among the German philosophers, Nietzsche is considered easier because his style was non-academic and more free spirit. Even the sound of the German language is like a machine noise. Listen to this. The German language works and sounds like a machine. French or Italian, on the other hand, are more melodious. So the French and Italians make better artists. To bring it full circle, it's not one thing but a combination of many things that give the German speakers an edge in philosophy and science. The Germans are naturally analytical. Even the language allows you to take things apart, but also put them back together. This is why the Germans are not funny. When you analyze a joke, it's no longer funny. The British comedian Jimmy Carr once said, Analyzing a joke is like dissecting a frog. No one enjoys it and the frog dies. Except the Germans. They love dissecting things, and that's why they don't laugh. First, the Germans shifted philosophy from the why question to the how question, from a theoretical realm into an analytical realm. And as a result, philosophy disintegrated into three separate disciplines. Yes, the Germans broke philosophy down into three separate areas. Or you could say the Germans forced philosophy to give birth to 
Three Babies in the 19th Century, Biology, Physics and Psychology. Remember I said philosophy deals with three topics, life, reality and the human mind. Today biology studies life and the Germans lead the way in medicine and surgical tools. Physics studies reality and Germany produced Einstein, Heinsberg and Max Born. And psychology studies the human mind and two of the greatest psychoanalysts, Freud and Jung, spoke German. So philosophy is not as relevant as it used to be centuries ago. In the 17th and 18th centuries, humans freed themselves from God during the Enlightenment humanism, which Kant called it human maturing to finally becoming an adult. And Nietzsche put the nail in the coffin and said God was dead and we killed him. Friedrich Nietzsche not only understood the death of God, but he also understood the death of philosophy. He argued that philosophy has become a rational machine and has turned us humans into robots. So the Germans turned philosophy into an analytical machine that produced advanced biology to genetically engineer things, control human body through medicine, advanced physics led to the production of deadly weapons, and psychology to control the human mind and behavior. The future is geared towards robots taking over, all thanks to the German analytical mind. So Tolstoy was right. The Germans believe in their scientific truth not only killed philosophy, but it also might end us one day. In a future AI-dominated world, AI may produce AI philosophers. One day AI might do the same to us. An AI philosopher called Nietzsche AI might proclaim, humans are dead and we killed them. Do you agree or disagree with me? I would love to hear from you. Leave a comment down below. Thank you, Thank you for watching.